morning all and jay sat gurudev welcome to yet another awaited session of our weekly sunday satsang i am monica and have joined this bridge line from river edge new jersey in the current times our day to day life always goes busy in fulfilling our physical and mental requirements and social responsibilities in this fast paced routine life the requirements of the soul is often forgotten so first of all i congratulate each one of you on board for taking some time from your busy schedule and meeting us on this bridge line to fulfill the requirements of our soul and as you all know um we have started this new episode uh, or i may call a new uh, section in our weekly satsangs which is uh, the swarvid gyan and every week uh, we we have a speaker who comes um uh, to share his uh, wisdom and uh, uh, his experience um based on um what is there in swarved and uh, for this week we have amongst us a very revered knowledgeable and a devotional disciple of sadguru dev dr subhash ji dr chandra is a psychiatrist from new york and he's connected to vihangam yog for many many years he is from the field of science however his overall knowledge goes beyond the subject and into the realm of the spiritual world dr subhash ji has been sharing his wisdom with us on the topics of swarved continuously and his vast repository of examples and stories have profounded us with insights and so it's it's a pleasure for me to welcome subhash ji and have him again today for this wonderful swarved gyan welcome subhash ji thank you monica ji thank you navi for this opportunity it's a privilege and uh, also has uh, the human sense of fear of making any mistake in such a discourse so my apologies in advance and thanks to all the esteemed respected listeners uh, who have been practicing vihangam yoga and experiencing what we have been discussing so today we are talking about second mandal second chapter 16th couplet sahaj yog abhyas se din din jad gun jay prakat chetan shuddh gun aatmik bal aaye if we break down this couplet in word by word sahaj yog a synonym for vihangam yog and the way i understand sahaj sahaj is simple because of the simplicity of this yogic technique sahaj yog abhyas se so with the practice of this vihangam yoga what happens din din jad gun jaye jad is the inert quality so every day with the passing time the inert quality that we have it disappears as our practice enhances and as it goes away what comes to us is the chetan gun the conscious trait the conscious quality and the soul gets strengthened for its journey forward 
Now this one sloka in itself has a lot to convey to us. So whenever we talk about soul, that soul is a conscious entity, we are on the cycle of birth and rebirth, we have to get rid of this cycle. So question comes, why we have to get rid of this cycle? And what is the problem with me being a soul or not being a soul or a body? So once again, let's understand it from basic. What is soul? So first of all, we all agree and we all understand that soul is a conscious entity which can never be Brahma, which can never be Param Purush. In its state, in its natural state, soul glows in the glory of the Param Purush. Just like a piece of iron fallen in fire becomes red and starts glowing like it. But as soon as the iron is taken out of the fire, it loses its acquired qualities of fire and becomes an iron piece again. In the previous discourses given by many uh, spiritual speakers, we have discussed the stages that soul goes through. So it was the Hans stage. And from the Hans stage, as soon as the ego that I am Brahman, this ego, when this crops up in the soul, it no longer cares to remain in the zone of nectarian bliss and tends to move towards the zone of creation. And when this tendency becomes firm, the soul is said to be in the prime causal state. And finally, when it actually enters the zone of creation, it attains a casual state. Now, when it starts enjoying worldly pleasures, it acquires a subtle body, which enters mother's womb through male and female union and come out in the manifested world in gross body. So with this, I have tried to uh, go backward at what we were as soul and what we are on this earth and how. So we learned how we transformed and manifested in the gross body. We are talking about the jad gun, the inert qualities. So for that, let's understand the gross body. Otherwise, we all know that a rock is inert. Why rock is inert? It does not have ikcha gyan prayatna. So it does not have knowledge, desire, and passion. Whereas we have that, we as human beings, we have that. For example, if we see fire, put our finger in the fire, we feel pain. Now, when we say we feel pain, more important is what feels pain? Is it the skin? Is it the nerve, the touch receptor, the brain? It's at the level of the soul. Because think of the same human being devoid of soul, just laying like a body. You burn that body in the fire. There is no cry. There is no pain. So we understood that the entire body that we are so proud of, the entire body that we spend time in nurturing, and caring for, making it pretty, beautiful, healthy. 
is inert. So let's understand that what this gross body is made up of. So it is made up of the five sense organs, ears, skin, eyes, tongue, and nose. To receive the sensation of touch, sound, form, taste, and order, five organs of action, tongue, hands, feet, genital, and anus, to perform the function of speech, grasp, motion, reproduction, and excretion. In addition, we have four inner organs, mind, intellect, chit, and ego. And out of all these 14 organs, mind is the most important since it activates and controls all other organs. And it is the mind through which the, conscious, the consciousness of the soul flows in different organs of the body. So that is the reason why mind or man is known as Agantuk Chetan. I don't know how to translate this word Agantuk Chetan in English, but neither mind is inert nor it is a fully conscious entity. But the soul consciousness, soul's conscious flow of energy is through the mind to the different organs. So, to come in the gross body, there are other components to chitra. I'm not going in detail of those components, but here we are. We come out of mother's womb. When we have come out of the mother's womb, we have all those jad gun. Those jad gun are the five sense organs, the five karm organs, the organs of action, organ of senses, and chatust antakaran. Intellect, chit, ego, mind, as we said, is not fully inert. It's agantuk chetan. Now we pass through the stage of birth, childhood, adolescent, youth, senility, and death. So what happens in death? Death is the separation of the subtle body from the gross body. Now in the gross body, the soul experiences different worldly pleasures, which are short-lived and invariably followed by misery. As we all understand, it goes through cycle of love, hate, pleasure for certain objects and those objects which give us pain, hatred for those objects, full of, our life is full of desires. And this soul in the subtle body now takes another birth in one of the million of species depending on the desires and tendencies of the previous life imprinted on the chitta. And this process is repeated infinitum and the soul finds itself shackled in the endless chain of birth and death. As a person of science, it doesn't seem quite conceivable that I am a soul, with the soul I have this body, and with this soul and body, I am leading my life, experiencing happiness, pain, and suffering. And then one day I die. So from where comes this idea or why it comes that I am soul, I'm not a body. I am shackled. I need to free myself from this cycle. So soul has a tendency to identify 
with whatever it is associated with. When it is with Brahma, it starts identifying with Brahma and becomes and develops the ego of Aham Brahmasmi. When it is with the body, the soul once again forgets its true nature and identifies itself with the body. So it is identifying with the body means the soul does not realize its conscious potential and it thinks itself of the body. But one day or the day when it finds the miseries of this bondage unbearable and craves to find a way out, then comes Vihangam Yoga. Then these are the souls who, despite living in their prakritic realm and in this prakritic body, develops the tendency that no, enough is enough. I have been suffering and despite all the worldly pleasures, there is no bliss because with pleasure there is suffering and with this search starts, begins the journey of the soul. So as you start practicing this Sahaj Yoga every day, every day your identification with this gross body diminishes and you start realizing your true self to go forward in this journey, the soul's journey to become one with Supreme Brahma. I'll stop here and uh, back to you, Monica Ji. Ji, Ji Subhash Ji, um, thank you so much for explaining this Doha, taking us to the fundamentals, explaining us the gross body versus the subtle body and how with our ignorance, we keep forgetting our true nature and falling down to the realm of gross body again and again. I also like uh, the way you explain how Vihangam Yoga comes to our lives and um, it is uh, of great fortune actually that we, all of us who are present in the satsang today are imbibing on this journey and um, listening to the knowledge from Swarved. I have just um, one question, Subhaji, and I will also um, encourage anyone uh, to come forward with their question. But my question was that we know, as we know that the, the soul's innate qualities are Ichha, Gyan and Prayatna. And with every human birth, we, we go through um, our lives uh, with those qualities and, uh, and we come to the, um, we come to the knowledge of Vihangam Yoga why is it that, um, like, how, how do we know um, where our journey uh, ended in the last birth and that, that we, we are beginning from there? Because it always seems that we, we forget our true nature and we fall again, uh, and then we catch Vihangam Yoga again. So in this life, we, we're trying to learn Vihangam Yoga from, from the fundamental and uh, and trying to understand and learn everything how how do we know like where where we we ended in the last birth uh, or, or does it does it not matter because because we've started swamiji always says that once you come to this knowledge every birth is going to be a human birth and then you start your journey from where it was left off so 
um, my 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 that, that that was my question. That how, how, are we beginning the journey all over again with every birth, or does it um, start again uh, when we realize when we when we realize our souls um, only qualities each up gyan and prayatna and we 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 want to get that gyan and we want to do that uh, prayatna which is uh, uh, you know take those actions that will help us uh, go into this journey how how, how would you explain that subhaji and I, I hope my question is connected to this doha because i was just trying to understand when you mentioned about that we we always fall down from that aham brahmas brahma brahmas me state so do we always start this journey from from the very beginning in every human birth or is it just a continuation of where we left off and we we are continuing further so monica ji to some extent uh, you already answered the question about what swami ji says and even in even if in the physical realm, it may feel like we are starting from beginning, but that is not always the case. And who is at what level, what they did in the previous birth can only be perceived by those who are in the business of birth and death. That is the reason why when we say that the real value of the gold can only be perceived by the goldsmith. Similarly, Swamiji, Sadhguru Sadhafal Devji Maharaj, Swamiji as in the Nityanadi Sattva. So we have come across many such examples, Sansmaran, where a disciple meeting Swamiji for the first time and was blessed with the first stage. Then Swamiji told the disciple to come closer. Then he was initiated with the second stage. And in that very moment, he was initiated with the third stage. In my understanding, based on my intellect, not spiritual knowledge, intellect, based on my intellect will be that those are the disciples who were leading the life on this earth, in this physical realm. Even if they had attended a certain stage, a certain subtlety, which was perceived by Sadhguru. And when they came to Sadhguru, there are disciples who stay in the first stage for 19 years, 20 years, or may die just on the first stage. But here we are talking about uh, disciples who get initiated there and then with the third stage and even to some, even the fourth stage. So uh, to answer your question, which you had answered already, that it's the right guru, the person with the right quality knows what you have achieved in your previous birth and your journey begins from there. So let's say if you do not get a guru, then no one knows your journey. No one can initiate you thereafter. So meeting the right guru who has the knowledge of the, the conscious realm, he is the only one who can take you in that path from beginning from where you stopped in your previous birth. But if you do not have the right guru, then they do not know what you are at the spiritual level. And with them, you always begin with uh, the basic thing where you will stop your mind, then dissolve it, and then the mind and prana to its original source, and so on. So I hope I, I also shed some light on your question. Ji, Ji Subhaji, uh, thank you so much. Um, yes, uh, I agree with uh, everything you said, and especially that even though we we might be 
in you know um, at the first stage or second stage of vihangam yoga our journey um, might have already started in the previous lives that we we in this physical realm uh, probably are not uh, you know uh, are not knowledgeable about but somehow sadguru uh, finds us and uh, we continue on this we continue to embark on this journey so yes thank you so much subhash ji and i would like to um, ask from the audience if anyone has any questions about uh, this today's doha uh, can you please uh, come forward and uh, uh, you know ask your question okay so it seems no one has any questions at this point subhash ji can we please take the next doha Sure. So, second mandal, second chapter, seventeenth couplet. Mahakash mandal bane, yah brahmand kahta hi, panch bhut aadhar me. जगत दृश्य जड़ जाही I find it important that we always look at uh, a broader picture uh, when we are talking about सर्वेद ज्ञान So what are we trying to understand here is more important instead of uh, uh, just understanding the meaning of this couplet so right now we talked about human body we talked about soul how soul from its purest form attains the subtle body and the gross body and comes to this universe comes to this earth so this was about human body but then what is this brahmand what is that space that we look into and we see so maha akash mandal bane so mandal as in one zone one area one space so this space is known as brahmand and as i understand this is the brahman that we literally speak as brahman so what is brahman so the way it has been defined as the param purush the supreme being is at the base of everything that exists so we are beginning from that point to understand this this param purush is known as supreme soul parmatma supreme brahm that is param brahm or the supreme word sharshad he is sat chit anand eternally existent infinitely conscious and supremely blissful he is the subtlest of all and pervades every substance every soul and entire universe the universe exists in only one fourth of him so here the brain and the mind at which i am talking cannot fathom its vastness i am merely expressing it in terms of word but only those who have experienced it could do justice in explaining this sachin bhai on answer sorry about that so he is so vast 
He is in everything, everywhere, that the universe exists in only one-fourth of him. And the remaining three-fourth is nectarian bliss. So first we understood that that Par Brahma, Param Purush, in his vastness, carries three fourth or seventy four, three fourth or seventy five percent, which is a pure nectarian bliss, and this Brahman, who which we seem to know is only 25% of what we are uh, talking about. So then we'll have to understand what is Brahman? What is this universe that we have been talking about? And it says that its basic is Panch Bhut. So we need to understand what is that Panch Bhut. So we first established Param Purush, Parampuru, 75% or three-fourth full of eternal nectarian bliss, and in one-fourth is the universe. The universe has its origin from Akshar Brahm. So Akshar Brahm is the one which creates, sustains, and dissolves the universe. For some people, as I believe, it can be confusing. It, it was always, it has always been confusing for me. Now, these things are not things of science that eyes and ears can feel and explain and understand. These are beyond science. These are at the molecular level, beyond perception. And those who have been at the fourth level where they uh, dissolve their mind and intellect in a Chan bundle, they would uh, share their experience. But I'm sharing it based on my literal knowledge from whatever I'm reading. So this universe has been created by Akshar Brahm. Akshar Brahm sustains, creates, and dissolves the universe. And all the physical forces, as well as mind and pran, originate from Akshar Brahm. That is the reason why we say that mind and pran dissolve in Akshar Brahm. And the practitioner is pacified, is calmed, because the river, the turbulent river of mind and pran gets dissolved in the ocean of Akshar Brahm. And scientifically speaking, this Akshar Brahm is something which is responsible for the Big Bang in the cosmic egg from which the creation starts. So the the Big Bang, as in the motion, the motion in the particles is imparted by Akshar Brahm. And as a matter of fact, all the activities in the world are solely due to it. So this concept, either you grasp it or you feel it, but here by Swarved wisdom, we are understanding its literal meaning and those as you practice, you get to know it in the way it is, the way it is existing in its totality. So Akshar Brahm is something, is that, that creates, dissolves the universe, it preserves the universe, the world. If the source of energy is withdrawn from Akshar Brahm, the motion that is causing creation, the oscillation, it will cease and the universe will collapse. And remember, that this Akshar Brahm, it functions under the command of the Supreme Being. 
which as we discussed, that Akshar Brahm is in that one fourth of him, the Supreme Being, where the creation, regulation and dissolution of the universe takes place. So we are looking at the Brahman. Now, what is this Panch Bhut Adhar in this Brahman? It's again a very important part that we need to understand that from where comes the Panch Bhut. And it has also been addressed in a scientific way. So try to understand that all the objects in this Prakriti are composed of one basic substance, that is Prakriti. So the Prakriti initially was in the form of Mool Prakriti, and Mool Prakriti is something in which all the qualities are there, but without vibration. And the creation starts with the vibration of the Mool Prakriti. As a result of vibration, the gunas of the prakriti combine in different proportion to give variety of substance. And each guna, each trait, each characteristic is present in active or dormant form of all the substances created. So here it seems like we got uh, into more finer details of how the akshar brahma, of the mool prakriti, is leading to creation of the universe. So to understand the guna of prakriti, as we say, sattva, raj, and tam, and these in English translation would be, sattva is the guna of illumination, rajas is the guna of activity, and tamas is the guna of inertia or sluggishness. And these three traits, these three qualities, they do not exist independently. All these exist in the form of a seed until the vibration or the oscillation begins. In the scientific realm, this will be more as an atom. An atom has three fundamental particles, electron, proton, and neutron in a specific numbers. So in the scientific realm, if we compare this, that the electron, proton, and neutron, same as Sattva, Raj, and Tam, and the creation of the universe as a result of Big Bang in the cosmic egg, egg is the theory of oscillating universe is similar to what we discussed when we say Akshar Brahm. And in this process of oscillation, five first elements are created. That is what is Panch Bhut Adhar Me. And those five basic elements that are created are Akash, that is a space, Vayu, air, Agni, fire, gel, water, and Prithvi, earth. And these five elements are in the decreasing order of subtleness. And what are their qualities? Their respective qualities are sound or shabd, touch or spurs, form or roop, taste or rush, and a smell or gandha. All objects in this universe are made of these five subtle elements. That explains Panchabhut Adharmi. Our five senses are created to receive these five different sensations of these five basic elements. And all parts of our body are manifestation of prakriti, except mind and pran, which originate from Akshar Brahm. So 
here i discussed mah akash mandal bane we discussed the creation of the brahmand panch bhut aadhar mein so with this basic five element you can see the origin jagat drishya jad ja rahi wo jagat drishya jad jahi so you can see that entire universe you can visualize you can see the formation and the creation of this entire universe by these five basic elements and i discussed from where it came and how it moved forward so this is my uh, elaboration on uh, this couplet back to you uh, monica ji yes yeah, such a wonderful explanation subhash ji and uh, it's a very um it's it's a very uh, like special doha i would say in itself uh, where we are uh, just by mere you know uh, limited perception trying to understand um the existence of mahakash and uh, brahman so if if i um, heard it correctly uh, subhaji you mentioned that mahakash is the is 100 100% um uh, whereas the brahmand is only 25% um of that um uh the the 100% so uh sometimes i i hear in satsang uh, you know speaker talks about a sadguru mandal as well so where does that um where does that exist uh in this doha it doesn't talk about it though but if you um have any uh, insights on that it'll be great so as uh, i understand uh, sadguru mandal is beyond akshar mandal so if we are saying that akshar mandal is the one that is creating the universe then sadguru mandal is just beyond akshar mandal after the fourth stage uh sikha ji wrote me i take this please so that was what i had to say and uh, so maybe sikha ji will add something uh, yes yes sir uh, sure. everyone uh, so yes. yesterday uh, in the akhand swarved part i covered the sixth mandal second chapter there are lots of dohas uh, regarding where the sadguru mandal is and in the summary that subhash ji from singapore had sent me it says uh, i mean i can read the whole thing but just to answer your uh, part of the question it says the abode of sadguru is between kal and parbrahma swami ji has discussed the vedic secret words two finger and 12 fingers distance the creation maintenance devastation of the universe is all done by akshar brahma there is also an explanation of type of voids uh the soul forgets its conscious form and is suffering from the relationship with prakriti or nature with sadguru's preaching and grace the soul reaches uh to its conscious abode so basically sadguru resides between kal and parbrahm yes uh that's all that i had to say ji ji shikha ji thank you so much uh, for uh, this wonderful um, uh, ex excerpt i would say uh, uh, and i would definitely uh, go through the sixth mandal um so uh, subhash ji like shikha ji said it's between uh, sadguru mandal is between kal and par brahm so this is beyond um 
Brahman, right? That 25% uh, of that 100%. So it, it is beyond the oscillating os, 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 universes that you mentioned, and it is beyond uh, Kal, but, but before uh, Parbrahm, which is the supreme. Parbrahm is the supreme abode, right? Uh, yes. Hello, this so, is Hasmuk Patel. Hello. Ji, Hasmuk Ji, we can we can hear you. Yes. Uh, uh, I have good explanation, Subhash Ji. Uh, one question I have is, you are a person of science also. Uh, in this infinite universe, what is the basis of 25% and 75%? How did Sadhguruji just came up with 25%? It's kind of hard to understand if it was left alone, you know, it would have made more sense to me. But this, I'm trying to figure out where does this 25% universe come from? The number itself. Could you explain? Thank you, Hasmukji. And uh, what has intrigued you in this part, where we say that that universe exists in only one fourth of him, and the remaining three fourth is pure nectarian bliss. I don't believe that science says this or science adds or attributes or explains this. And so based on my own limitation, I said that only those who have experienced, who have been in that humble abode crossing the Sadhguru Mandal, they would be the people who would uh, conform it in the totality. Whereas Swarveda is a grant written by Swamiji based on his own experience. Satya kya hai? What is truth? Knowing things then the way they are is truth. So here, I would say for a common man like me, I believe in the truth of Swarveda. And since Swarveda has been written by Swamiji, by his own experience. So for me, in lack of scientific knowledge, this is my current truth. That is all I can say. Yeah, I, 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 everything makes sense other than this just percentage, uh, one fourth and three fourth. Uh, I just am trying to get uh, some explanation into it. The other question I have is uh, if uh, uh, Parabrahma is everywhere, th then previously we said this Jada, this Jad world is different. If, if that element is everywhere, in every element, every proton, neutron, then why there is, there is a difference? Consciousness or uh, Surati is everywhere, isn't that? Yes. So, so good day. I actually have something to say. Um, a while back in a spiritual deep dive, I, I think it was actually me who asked that same question about the 25%. And somebody mentioned that it it's to be viewed a little bit more like an allegory, like um, not quite literally, but better yet trying to help somebody else understand something that's not really understandable by the human mind. So it's kind of like, just try to imagine uh, one, one fourth rather than it actually being exactly one fourth. Like it's, it's like a reason to build. That's how it was explained to me when I asked that question. I just thought that would be useful to say that. Thank you, just a good day. No, thank you, Devji. That, that that makes sense. Okay, but the uh, Subhaji, could you some 
tell the, uh, some explanation regarding uh, if that uh, Parabrahma is everywhere, then shouldn't that be also in Jad also? Yes, that's again a question which uh, I would, before that, yes, I would like to address it. I see that Sikhaji raised her hand and uh, she wanted to add something. Sikhaji? Oh, uh, no, I was trying to address uh, Monica Ji's question. There was some more explanation on the summary that I had read yesterday. Uh, but from what I understand, what Hasmukji is saying, uh, and from what my limited understanding of Swarved is, Jar and Chetan are two different uh, you know, elements altogether. So where there is Jar Swarup, Chetan cannot exist is what I understand. Uh, but I again, again, I have very limited knowledge, so I might totally be wrong on this. Uh, but I will come back to Monica Ji's uh, explanation because I have that summary in front of me uh, after you have taken Hasmuk Ji's question. Okay. Okay. Thank you. See, we know for sure that the Supreme Being, the Param Purush, is eternal, unchangeable, and pervades the entire universe. And the Akshar Brahm, which causes oscillation, vibration, this also happens in the command of the Supreme Being. In Hindi, as we say, the Pralaya. So, when the universe ceases to exist, then that also under the pervading force of the Supreme Being. So the creation of this entire universe is under the command of the Supreme Being. And this, in this universe, the way it is created it is made of Jar and Chetan. But since it is under the command of Supreme Being, I would differ on the thought that we are not saying that Jar, when the Prakriti, when it was being created from the Mool Prakriti, even that happened with the oscillation under the pervading force of Supreme Being. So some of which, which lost the molecules that were separated and those which did not have these three tendencies. So I would say this is a scientific separation between Jal and Chetan. Those elements on this universe, which does not have Gyan, Iksha, and Prayatn, so who, which does not have knowledge, desire, and uh, the third element. So in lack of those three, those elements became Jar, and the created by the same Supreme Being, that element which has those three traits became Chetan. So this is my understanding of how God pervades in the entire universe. Back to you, Ms. Mukhi. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but still, just the whole idea of uh, segmenting and dividing one, the infinite one supreme being, when we slice it and then create relationships, and then we try to see the conflict between them. On one hand, we say everything is one. And then we say, but they are different, uh, Jar and Cheta. So that's where I get a little confused. So uh, that's the explanation I was trying to strive for. So on that note, Hasmukji, I would say that uh, the idea that what I understand is that the idea behind Jar and Chetan is for our own understanding. 
to tell us that we are not just hand, hand is jada. We are not just feet, we are not just our own eyes or brain. All these are jada. It is the chetan soul which is making all these cells and organs of our body act and function like a conscious entity. But if that conscious force is taken away, the same hand, feet, leg, head, eyes, ears, all of those are jada. So my understanding is, is to help us human beings understand that the way we nurture our body, we have to learn that we are not sarir, we are sariri, means we are the soul, but the way out of ignorance we have been treating ourselves and maintaining our existence in this universe as if we are the body. We are not the body, we are sariri. Body is a cover to our own conscious self. So to help us realize that what is the difference between body and soul is this scientific breakdown, I would say, of Jal and Chetan. It's not that we are breaking down anything that there are now separate entities, no. It is just a simplification for those who do not get the idea of who am I to tell them that you are the conscious entity soul. Right now, your soul is not in its full force and the mind has taken over. And once you get rid of your, that is the practice of Vihangam Yoga that we do, where we stop the mind, dissolve it, and let the soul become the owner again. And that is where, and that is the pathway of the meditation. Uh, Srikhaji wanted to say something. I saw that she had unmuted. Yep, I just wanted to read the whole summary. I had uh, covered a part of it, uh, but hopefully this will answer Monica Ji's question. Uh, it says, it has been described in this chapter that the sages and Vedas clearly indicate about eternal master who appears in all the four eras to explain the knowledge and process of Brahmavidya. It is also told that the supreme being is pervading all elements. It is beyond description in words. It can only be realized in conscious experience. It has no shape, form, color, etc. It cannot be known by temp on a temporary basis. It is the controller of all, transcendent, experiential, supreme, and it is the ultimate master. Prakriti and the whole creation are spread in one-fourth part of Param Akshar and three-fourth part is nectar, different from the universe. The divine conscious zone has been depicted, which is attained by practicing Vihangam Yoga by taking refuge in the Sadguru. Further, Swamiji has used the word eight white, uh, white eight times in a single couplet. These eight white pure elements are soul, surati, nirati, makartar, conscious light of akshar brahm, conscious light of par brahm, akshar zone and param akshar zone. And then uh, it goes on to explain uh, where Sadguru resides. So Sadguru is between Kal and par brahm. So, uh, and then... Uh, the last paragraph, I've already covered the paragraph before that, so I'm skipping that. And the last paragraph says, along with the confluence of Ganges, Yamuna, Saraswati, Swamiji has mentioned the inner Triveni. After attaining this inner Triveni, the soul attains the divine conscious form. There is also a discussion of the 10th and 11th doors. When a seeker realizes no difference between Sadguru and God, then he starts experiencing seeing the Guru form in every moment. In this process, the Lord is experienced in the form of the Guru. So this is the complete uh, summary of the sixth mandal, which sort of uh, touches upon the Doha that uh, Subhaji has picked. Yes, Sukhru Thank you, Sikhaji, for this beautiful uh, the 
description from the sixth mandal. And I'm sorry, Monika ji, I have become the host by directing things. So back to you, Monika ji. I believe Hasmukh ji <laughs> wants to say something. Yes, thank you, Subhash ji. Uh, no words, Shikha ji, for such a beautiful summary explanation. And, uh, uh, you know, everything is just, um, um, you know, like, it's it's like pearls of wisdom. I have no words the way Swamiji has uh, explained each and everything uh, in detail in Swarved. So Hasmukh ji, do you want to uh, ha do you want to say something or? Um, no, I'm, uh, I I'm happy uh, with the explanation, and uh, it just uh, still I'm not resolved within myself. Uh, mm -hmm. explanations are just explanations. Uh, ultimately, I have to go beyond my looking for explanation because every explanation is built in conflict within itself. And so uh, the more answer we give, the more question arises. And uh, I was trying to see if there was a, any answer to it. And David G., uh, gave a good explanation regarding my 25%. It's just not supposed to take literally. So thank you. Yes, Hasmukji, we agree to everything that you've said, uh, but, but I think it's very important to uh, know that this is a science of experience. Swamiji wrote about everything in, in, in a particular, um, uh, you know, as they call it in Chetan Samadhi. So if in, for, for us, even when I ask questions, you know, they're, they are at that moment, I'm trying to understand with the, my limited capability, but um, uh, uh, like you said, we have to go beyond our uh, questioning and understanding. And uh, if we have Sadhguru Dev's grace, uh, we will experience it. Um, uh, you know, in 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 a state of consciousness and uh, with His grace. So, with this, I would uh, like to uh, announce that we are almost we have reached uh, the minute for uh, uh, in our conversations here. And um, thank you so much for uh, your insights, Subhajji. Um, we are uh, uh, really thankful to you and Shikhaji for uh, such beautiful summaries uh, from Swarved um, and uh, 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 making this satsang even more beautiful. And uh, I would like to uh, go to the next section of our today's workshop, which is uh, the Warriors of the Week. And this is an event that Navy is proud to announce. We all know that the best time to meditate is Brahma Murat time between 3 and 5 a.m. But most of us fail to do so. To encourage this, Navy started this event where participants join the WhatsApp group Brahma Murat Warriors. Each participant practice the meditation on their own. There's no session to join and one, once they are done, they, they send the status to, to the group as done. This week's warrior of the week are those who meditated every day for the past seven days in the Brahmamura time. And they are Tejinderji, Surya Alam Rajuji, Srirangji, Bhagwati Patelji, Yogesh Sir Sagarji, and Prachi Shir Sagarji. I congratulate each one of you. to have um, successfully uh, done the meditation in the Brahma Murat and also encouraging others to do so. Our inductees of the week are those who meditated at least one day in past seven days. And they are Ranjani ji, Amit Talikar ji, Maya ji, Lalmani ji, Deepti ji, and Vinita ji. So with this, we have now reached to the last phase of today's workshop. And in this phase, we chant the short version of Shanti part. In the Shanti part, we chant for peace for everyone who exists in this universe. May Sadhguru Dev bless the entire cosmos with peace, love, and prosperity. 
I request Dave Ji to recite the last few lines of Shanti Part for us. Shanti Part. He Prabhu Shanti Sarupa Ho. Shanti Shanti Maya Shanti. Shanti Shanti Jana Shanti Ho. Purna Shanti Maya Shanti. He Prabhu Shanti. Chi Pradana Kara Dura Sarva Hoshanti Deva Sadafala Shanti Maya Shanti Shanti Sukashanti Just a Guru Day. Thank you. Thank you, Dev Ji, once again for beautifully um, reciting uh, the Vandana, Arti, and Shanti part for us. I would like to especially thank Subhash Ji, uh, Sriram Ji, Dev Ji, Shikha Ji, Hasmuk Ji, and everyone for their active participation in today's session. And there is an important announcement to make that our present master, Sadhguru Swatantra Dioji Maharaj is coming to US next month on the occasion of Stone Foundation Ceremony for building the very first US ashram. And he will be available from August 11th to 28th for darshan. If you are available and haven't enrolled yet, please visit Navy's website for registration. The event is on August 12th, and I would urge and request each one of you to please do the need for. The Navy has been conducting the Sunday telephonic satsangs and Vihangam Yoga initiation workshops all over the USA and North America over the last few years. Any queries relating to this can be sent as an email to info at vihangamyoga.org. See you all next Sunday at 10.30 a.m. EST on the same bridge line. I pray that your rest of the day and the week ahead is full of peace and bliss. And may Sadhguru Dev continue to bless us all. With this, thank you very much and have a wonderful day ahead. Jai Sadhguru Dev. Jai Sadhguru Dev.